Welcome to Photos with Stories. We're back after a little hiatus. We took a little bit of a break uh, here towards the end of the year uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, mostly because we're going to kick this off big. And we're back after a little hiatus and uh, a break uh, here towards the end of the year. I've got to turn off your Facebook there, uh, Sherry, if it's on. Just kill that browser. I'm here. Echo. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to come back big in 2021. We got a bunch of really great shows on tap with some really cool people. And we're going to try to expand it a little bit. It'll be photos with stories, uh, but in a meta kind of way, uh, we're going to do some things that are stories with photos. Uh, very story heavy base, but a lot of photos to support it. Not necessarily photography, photos with stories, uh, and, but in a uh, meta kind photos of way, that we have long 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 stories with photos. Uh, um, here. Um, where is that sherry all of your browsers are closed yeah will harrison everybody um all right there we go i think it's gone uh anyway so here we are back for our final photos with stories and we have a great guest we have sherry rain barnett with us and uh uh before we um uh before we uh get with sherry just a couple of quick things again i want to thank the the fans.com slash relics magazine tech crew, Will Schward and Harrison Azradi, who will be uh, fielding your questions. So if you have any questions for Sherry or for me, um, you can put them in any of the places where you can ask questions on Facebook or YouTube or fans anywhere. And Harrison is out there aggregating those questions for the end of the program. Uh, I want to thank Pete Shapiro. I want to thank Jonathan Healy and Stephanie, Stephanie May, our marketing director for uh, photos with stories. So thanks everybody for making this happen. We appreciate your time uh, um, and um, uh, energy in making fans.com happen. Uh, I want to thank all the people who watch this and for sharing it and letting other people know about it. I really appreciate that. Um, this is a fun show for me to do because I get to learn all about other people and their photography and their careers. I did not know Sherry before we decided to do this. She was watching the show. She discovered photos with stories on uh, my Facebook page, I believe, and uh, asked me if I'd be willing to do one with her because she had a new book coming out. And I said, absolutely, I'd love to. She sent me a few samples of her photography and I said, let's do this. So let's all welcome Sherry Rain Barnett uh, to the show. Hi, Sherry, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you so much. And uh, make sure that all your Facebook stuff is all completely off and closed. Only thing you need up is your Zoom right now so we don't get any feedback or anything like that. Um, uh, so real quick, uh, Sherry is a New Yorker, um, but has lived in Los Angeles for 50 years, give or take a little bit less. And, um, uh, she, um, started her, her rock and roll adventure early on, uh, going to see some folk concerts and some rock concerts around the New York area in the late sixties. Um, she had a very cool mother who was very uh, into music. Her mother was a songwriter. Her mother took Sherry to the Brill Building at a young age, which must have been very inspirational um, to kind of see all of the things that were going on there. And I believe that her mother even had a song that was picked up by some of the Brill people, uh, Brill, Brill Building people, and um, and uh, as part of the uh, pop culture history of our world of music. Um, her dad gave her a camera in the 60s, uh, which kind of got her interested in that. She had real no formal training as a photographer, much like myself. We figured it out on our own. And she has created an incredible body of work uh, that is in a new book called um, uh, uh, Eye of the Music. Uh, it's out now. And uh, there's this website up here on this screen right now uh, from geniusbookpublishing.com where you can order that book or you can go to her website also sherrybarnettphotography.com and uh, you can find that book online and I believe that's the only places you could buy it right now is via these online sources. Uh, the book I the Music, uh, her photography from 1969 to 1989 is very, very cool and we are going to dig in deep with Sherry and look at some of her work and hear some of her history. So um, Sherry, talk to me a little bit about your early days in New York City in the mid 60s. Um, I think you went to see some music at the New York World's Fair out in Queens where you're originally from. Uh, 
how did you get the bug to just even be cool and hip enough to want to go see folk music back then? Uh, you're muted, Sherry. Hang on. I think, Will, do you have to unmute her? Hit your mute button, Sherry. There you go. I think you should be good. How about now? All right, we got you. So tell us about the tell us about those early um, music experiences for now you. Now I can't hear you. Oh no. Hold on. All right. Can you hear me now? Oh dear. Test, test, test. Check, check. Okay. It's already be sound checking for everybody. Okay, here. hold on. Late. Okay, I got you. You got me. Yep, I got you. Here we go. All right. So <laughs> Sherry, talk, talk to you about some of those early music experiences that you had in the. In right, the right. At the World's Fair and the the new Christy Minstrels and the, <laughs> the Grateful Dead in Central Park and things like that. All right. Well, you know, when I was growing up, I I you know I heard music every day. My mom practiced piano. Um, my uh, you know she was writing early rock and roll songs, and uh, and she got me started playing um, you know with music lessons. And she actually. Um, I actually started on the accordion and then my accordion teacher started teaching folk guitar and I was intrigued because that was much more, a, a you know, contemporary sound and a, a contemporary instrument to play. So um, I just, I wanted to go hear music live and I wanted to see the musicians uh, when my mom would take me to the real building, um, you know, the, the publishers and the um, the secretaries uh, for the artists or the publishers would always, um, give me something either like a 45 rpm or a um or a picture of the artist and i was very intrigued because it connected me to this to the sound of the music and a visual so um so yeah so i i uh, yes i went to the new york world's fair um because i heard that this folk group at the time the new christy minstrels were doing a um television taping so my mom dropped me off there <laughs> She was very liberal. She met their tour manager and said, hey, you know, my daughter wants to, you know, hang out for the day. You know, can you keep an eye on her? And so that's what happened. And I had my little uh, box camera. It was a, a blue brownie camera. As you can tell, I'm about, you know, all things blue. And uh, and so those those pictures I took when I was like barely 12 years old, I think, was our uh, there's a fellow named Thomas Pickles who composited those pictures and they're in the beginning of the book um, and shows the the World's Fair with the Unisphere behind it. Anyway, so that got me started. And then um, and then I guess I wanted to go hear more concerts. And so my mom would take me to Carnegie Hall to hear folk artists because that's what I was listening to by then. I was listening to folk music. So we went to see Judy Collins and Peter, Paul, and Mary and Ian and Sylvia and people like that. And, um, you know, I don't know later on what's that people that you went and saw before you had a camera you eventually got to photograph yes yes which is re which was like, really um, amazing did that feel the first time you started photographing these artists that you had seen previously with yeah. your mom or your dad or getting dropped off or whatever your friends yeah i mean did that like really turn you on that you felt like you were part of like something special or history in the making or something like that oh absolutely absolutely it was um you know, I was intrigued. I was, you know, passionate about going out and, and uh, uh, you know, just hearing any any artist I could. I mean, my dad took me to these early rock and roll shows, too, at Palisades Amusement Park, because, you know, growing up in New York, that's where you went for fun. You know, and again, it was the little box camera. You know, I have some very fuzzy old blurry, you know, some soft focus negatives <laughs> from them from that time. Who, did your dad give you your first 35 millimeter camera? No, no, no. He he had he had cameras that he had gotten during the war, and I started playing around with them. Um, and then, um, no, I don't I don't remember actually who uh, gave me my first camera. I think I was working after school. I was I was uh, running around Manhattan actually as a teenager after school. Um, uh, I worked as a messenger, and I'd get around, <laughs> I'd ride around on a bicycle, and I think I just. You know, made my own money to, to buy my first 35 millimeter camera. And, and uh, so the first time that you um, the first time that you took photographs where there was an audience, do you remember what show that was? 
Um, you know what? I think it was actually uh, before the Central Park Music. It was like the precursor to the Central Park Schaefer Music Festival. Uh, they had an uh, open band shell concert with Jefferson Airplane and uh, the Grateful Dead and Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And, uh, you know, I still had, I didn't have a 35 millimeter. I had my dad's old Voigtlander cameras. But that's, but you tried to get up front and tried to get pictures. Yes, down. I tried to get as close as possible. And, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'm not a big, I'm a short person. So I could kind of sneak in between people and make my way to the front and, you know, not rile anybody up. <laughs> so somewhere along the way, uh, you connect with an underground newspaper in New York City called The Corpus. And, yeah. uh, and they ask you to go and photograph Ike and Tina Turner. Um, and that's our first photo that we have here in the slideshow. Um, we have this incredible photograph of Tina Turner, um, which is just, look at her. I mean, this is just brilliant. I love this picture of her. And then uh, I believe this is maybe the next day in a hotel room. You have Ike and Tina and they're matching leopard print robes. I think that uh, Tina's maybe reading the Corpus Underground newspaper there. How did you get this assignment? How did you get a, mag a newspaper to be interested in enough in you and your photography to send you off to photograph Ike and Tina? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think that the answer was probably I was, uh, I was enthusiastic. I was willing to do it for nothing. You know, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a, a, a newspaper with a big budget. This was an underground paper um, uh, in the village. And it was situated, the offices were upstairs from a theater that funded the, the newspaper. And the theater was running a, a play about Che Guevara called Che. And, um, <laughs> and it was all done in the nude. It was just everybody was very avant garde there at, at Corpus. And um, I guess they just, uh, I guess they like me. <laughs> they believed in me. I, I, I'm sure I brought some pictures I had already shot to them, um, not, you know, that hadn't been published or anything. But the interesting thing or the fantastic part about it was that I got to go to um, the electric circus and shoot the show that night. But Prior to that, um, there, the editor of the newspaper was doing a an interview with Ike and Tina at the Chelsea Hotel, you know, and you know that was the rock and roll hotel. So we go to the Chelsea Hotel, and we go in there, and Tina is fast asleep in the bed. <laughs> she's like she's conked out, and um, you know, yes, they're wearing their their matching faux leopard PJs and robes. And so most of the interview was just with Ike um, because Tina was sleeping. And finally, <laughs> Tina wakes up. And the picture um, that you see in the book is, she, obviously, she's awake and sitting up and she's reading the Corpus magazine. She's seeing what you know the magazine's about. So. so from there, they liked what you turned in. They published it. You're now a very, very young published photographer. They're probably paying you a few dollars per picture. Right. And, um, you know, barely covering your costs in the dark room. And, right. and, but you're, the adventure has begun. Yes. So let's look at some of these other photographs here. Um, this first one here, this is a young Linda Ronstadt with, uh, is that Bernie Leiden who was later joined the Eagles? It's Yes, that's Bernie Leiden on the left on guitar. And um, what was interesting about this, I, I found out retrospectively, of course, is that um, this was a group that she put together just after the Stone Ponies. The Stone Ponies, she had the hit with different drum. Stone Ponies had broken up and she had a touring band for a short time with Bernie. And um, there's a bass player there. Uh, uh, John, I'm, you know, now I'm blanking on what his name is. John Ware on drums, who ended up in Emmy Lou Harris's hot band. They were all, you know, all interconnected, probably very incestuous. Um, but um, the group was actually called the Corvettes, little known fact. And then eventually, of course, Glenn Fry and Don Henley joined her band. Right. And then exactly. So Bernie, the, basically, she helped form the Eagles, essentially. She did. And I think uh, the story was that she suggested that they become the Eagles, which was interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, was willing to give them up as her backup band eventually. But the other picture also that's here is of um, the, the, the show at Town Hall was actually co-billed Eric Anderson and Linda Ronstadt. And Eric Anderson is just a very seminal folk artist 
who wrote River for Joni Mitchell and, and had a number of albums on Vanguard Records himself. So um, at, the, at the end, everybody came out on stage and that's uh, Debbie Green, his wife next to him, who apparently taught finger picking uh, guitar style to Eric Clapton, <laughs> other little known fact. And there's Bernie again and Linda and, and another artist named David Blue, who unfortunately never really, you know, became all that popular, but I know Rolling Stone just did a, uh, an article on him recently. Right, and then we get to one of our favorite Canadian musicians, um, oh, yeah. Mitchell. And, um, and is, this, is this the beginning of your tenure sort of shooting the Schaefer Music Festival? Is that where the shot of Joni is? Yeah, this was, um, this was one of the first shoots at the Schaefer Music Festival that I did. And, but Joni was already popular enough to have her own. It, she didn't have an opening act or anything. She just did the entire, oh no, she did have an opening act. Tim Harden was her opening act. Tim Harden was a, another wonderful singer songwriter that we lost too early. Um, Tim opened for her, but you know, she was al already quite popular. And uh, uh, you know, fortunately these, these pictures exist. I was still shooting, and a lot of the a lot of these photos, I was still shooting with one lens because that's what I could afford. I was shooting with a fifty millimeter lens. It wasn't like I was in the back of the venue, you know, with a long telephoto early on. This was like right, up close and personal. So well, um, the Schaefer Music Festival was in Central Park, and it went from like sixty seven into the eighties. Um, yeah. uh, uh, it's you know Schaefer was a beer. Um, I think I think in the late seventies I saw some Schaefer music festival stuff in in, in, in Central Park as well. Oh wow! Uh, also, we have John Denver. Who and now is this all Schaefer stuff that we're going to look at here? Yes, yes, in the here. Oh. Yes, it's it's all Schaefer. Um, yeah, th that was John Denver. I think Dion opened for him. And um, you know, the interesting thing is, is looking back. I mean, you know, ironically, here are these huge artists who. Um, you know, they're hitting their stride there, there and you could go see them. Apparently the tickets, which I, you know, fortunately I didn't even pay for because I was, you know, credentialed and shooting by that time, but the tickets were like two and $3, you know, and it was just a, kind of a, a, an amazing thing. And the, the venue held probably, you know, several hundred people at least. And then when that was full, there were people that sat on the rocks um, behind the venue ju just so that they could, you know, it was outdoors obviously. And the shows usually started late afternoon, like the next pictures that we're getting to, like Arlo Guthrie, you can tell it's actually daytime. Um, and then it would get to, you know, it would get dark. And like the following picture of Buffy St. Marie is um, obviously, you know, later in the evening, it's dark, you know, but it was, it was a great place to shoot and people just loved coming there. Yeah. And so the other thing I want to point out is that, um, it's a little misnomer, the Schaefer Music Festival. It wasn't like a one weekend thing with 25 bands. Oh my it, God. It was just like, it was a series. It was called yeah. the Schaefer Music Festival. It was a series. So it was, you know, whatever, on um, three, four nights a week in the summer. It would it was always in the summer, maybe start in May and go till September. And uh, every weekend, or I'm not sure what the schedule was, but these are just like individual shows. Joni Mitchell with somebody opening, John Denver with somebody opening, Buffy St. Marie, et cetera, et cetera. So, Let's go through a few more of these. We've got um, uh, uh, Buffy St. Marie, and then who's this after that? This oh, Tom, Tom Paxton. You know, he was he is still thriving. He's still touring. He was, uh, you know, he was a wonderful songwriter, is a wonderful songwriter. He finally just got a, a song used uh, uh, for a commercial, I noticed, on TV. So good for him after all this time. But he, you know, he had albums out, I think, also. I think he was on Electra. And um, he was he was also a protest singer, you know. He was a at a time at that time they were calling a topical song, so he was a topical songwriter. And, and then this uh, and Tim Harden after that. And Tim then Harden was another wonderful singer songwriter who you know ended up unfortunately a, another drug casualty. But uh, Tim Harden, Tim Harden, yeah, he you know, but he had a number of albums out and and songs that have really endured. So very, well. very famous folk artist names from from this time period: Judy Collins. Yeah. Uh, Miles Davis. Um, uh, this is Carol King, right? Yes. Well, now we're going to an, a new section here. Um, I just wanted to point out Judy Collins. Of course, you know, I was saying that my mom would take me to her Christmas concerts, actually, at Carnegie Hall. And Judy is just 
such an amazing artist. I mean, she's still performing, recording. Um, uh, she lives in Manhattan, apparently, and uh, she just was, you know, an iconic folk artist that moved from folk to to other genres too. She was one of the first people to record Joni Mitchell songs and Leonard Cohen songs. Yeah. So. Yes, and uh, I have a question for you. Didn't your camera get stolen at one of those shows? <laughs> What's the story? What's okay, the story? there's a good, there's a, well, I don't know how good a story it is, but it's kind of funny. Um, it was a, uh, there was a Little Richard and Beach Boys show that I had shot, and I met some young hippie guy there, and I ended up, like, making out with him in the grass, and my camera was stolen. <laughs> so, and, you know, it would be kind of a, you know, okay, so go get another camera. Well, first of all, you know, I wasn't exactly rolling in the bucks. I was rolling in the grass, I guess. But but the point was it was right before right before Woodstock, and I had no camera. So and you went to Woodstock, but you had well, no camera. I, I did. I went to Woodstock with with a friend of mine who was up for who I dragged in on into many adventures by that time. Who had been a friend of mine from junior high school, and um, uh, I think we just graduated junior high schools. But, but anyway, I, I, I'll make it quick. But I um, I heard that the the festival was at White Lake, not actually um, Woodstock, and so I in my own inimitable way, thought it would be fun to buy an inflatable boat and take it to Woodstock. So, <laughs> so we did, we took the inflatable boat and as we're trying to get into Woodstock and of course by then cars couldn't get in, nobody, and we were hitchhiking anyway, but you had to walk a mile or two, you know, with the crowds just to get to the site. So um, we, you know, stopped at the side of the road at a gas station. We thought we better inflate the boat now. So we inflated the boat. And um, of course, we're dragging it on the ground. <laughs> Bunch holes in the boat. So, and then it starts raining, you know, the story of Woodstock and the mud. And, you know, I'm a city girl. I didn't know how, I was not prepared for the rain. So, so wow. we get there. And by the time we get situated, we get a little place in the woods, in, in the forest near the stage. And we literally covered ourselves with the boat so we wouldn't get rained on to go to sleep. And I remember hearing Joan Baez singing, we shall overcome through the trees. Uh -huh. And, um, and okay. then I, I have little faith. I went, oh, it's just gonna rain and rain and rain. We don't have enough clothes. It's muddy, I'm leaving. And I left the next day. <laughs> well, you, you guys could have been the savior because you had the ark. You could have, everybody could have gotten the ark with you. At Woodstock. Right, right. Yeah. and you know, the funny thing was it was, a, the, it was supposed to be the Woodstock Music and Art Festival. And I know that I had had photographs approved for the art part of it. Um, that was the reason I was going too, um, even without a camera, but I don't know what happened to all that. <laughs> So we, we get back into New York City and we kind of start on this uh, this series of photographs that were taken uh, mostly at indoor venues. Um, and uh, we've got, you know, a bunch of different people. Let's talk about uh, we have Carol King. We have James Taylor and Joni Mitchell, which is just a, what an incredible pairing. I mean, this is such a historic photograph. It, um, yes, it was it was a it was a surprise because, first of all, nobody knew of Carol King yet but she was James Taylor's opening act and she did all the songs from Tapestry or you know as many as an opening act can do. And um, J uh, James came out and, and uh, sat at the piano with her and, and did You've Got a Friend for the first time. And, um, and then during, towards the end of his set, he brings out his special guest, Joni Mitchell. And mm -hmm. um, you know, the, actually these pictures are amongst the most you know, popular uh, as far as, you know, selling prints and getting and having them published of, of, of my archive. I mean, such, a, such a historic moment, you know, to see these people on these small stages and Joni and JT together, just super incredible. Uh, and then, you know, JT alone here is this, this photo. And then we get to Peter, Paul and Mary. Again, this is somebody that your mother maybe brought you to go see before you had a camera. So now you're photographing these people that are sort of your folk rock. Right, 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 right. And, right. and um, I'm going to guess based on your mother's liberal bent that you also probably had a liberal bent. And so you, <laughs> you were listening to these songs that they were singing that were sort of the soundtrack of the civil rights movement and, and, and later right. the you know, the late 60s, you know, cultural zeitgeist that came along with that. And so you're documenting them at this point, which is just such a cool thing. I mean, I feel the same way with what I do. Right. Um, uh, 
let's go on to Pete Seeger here. So, you know, there's so much going on in this photograph that I just love, you know, <laughs> the, the, the circular, half circular, quote unquote, American flags to drink the water, which of course is, you know, later in Pete Seeger's life was a huge issue with, you know, the Clearwater Music Festival. Oh, um, right, right, right. You're, there's so much stuff going yeah. on. Here, and of course, this is probably some sort of protest, um, some high stage, the police barricades. What is this? Why were you there? Okay, it was a um, it was a demonstration uh, at Times Square, and interestingly enough, the High School of Performing Arts where I was going to school was basically you know just literally walking distance blocks from Times Square. Um, you know, Times Square at Forty Second Street, and my school was on West Forty Sixth Street. So um, there were actually some of the people from my school who participated in the in the protest concert. Um, Pete Seeger performed, Mary, uh, uh, Peter, Paul and Mary, uh, Leonard Bernstein spoke, Tom Paxton played, and, and the uh, cast of Hair also was part of this particular uh, event. But, but yeah, it was all about, it was a concert for peace. It was, an, a, you know, the end of the war, uh, anti-war uh, protests. And then we go to Richie Havens, who obviously is another huge um, influential artist in that time, played at Woodstock. Uh, this is Phil Oakes, the folk singer, in this gold yeah. lame suit, which is incredible. Um, <laughs> and Joan Baez, again, barefoot Joan Baez. Yeah. I mean, so this is, these people, when you're photographing these people at this time, did you have any sense how important it was from a historic standpoint well i don't know for i don't know from a historic standpoint that obviously came later on but i had a, definitely a sense of the importance of all this because now there was a a reason for the music as well as as you know we had moved on from you know the the times where people just recorded other people's songs love songs and uh fun songs and now we we're people were speaking out in the songs that they were writing. And um, it was, you know, the, they were reflecting the culture and the culture was reflecting them. So it was, uh, it, it was a, a very profound time. And, um, you know, yes, and again, the, here are the artists again performing at Carnegie Hall. They were performing at Carnegie Hall and Town Hall. And uh, they were wonderful, you know, uh, acoustically, they were just, you know, the most beautiful rooms in New York. Um, and the and the the venues were his, historic. You know, it was later on, obviously, that that we knew how historic these these artists and uh, the times were. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, Melanie, I love this picture of Melanie. I mean, these you know these people like Melanie, uh, which was a, br a brand new key, right? That was the yes, first yes. song. But you know, then you get to this photo here after that, which is Don Mc Don McLean and. Um, I mean, every single person in this country, it didn't matter how old you were because this song, Bye Bye Miss American Pie, you know, American Pie was on the radio everywhere in this country. Like this was the conver this was the conversation piece, like, you know, this particular song. I mean, I was, you know, eight years old, maybe when this song came out, um, seven or eight years old. And it was on, you know, AM radio with, you know, WABC with Cousin Brucie and- right. uh, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everywhere you went, you know, and so, you, you know, the history, the history books, you just, you don't hear a lot about Don. You don't see a lot of photographs. This might be the first time I've ever even seen a photograph of Don from this time period when this song was probably one of the most important songs in our country, you know? So it's, it, to me, again, I look at this stuff and I'm like, this is, this is great history, right? This is pop culture history and just, you know, so important to me and to, to, to so many other people. Um, to see somebody like Don. And uh, and who are these, uh, I mean, where are these photos taken of Don and Reverend Gary Davis and Dave Van Ronk, who of course is famous for touring Greenwich Village with Bob Dylan and Susan Rodolo. Um, right. Where were these photos taken? Well, this, this is interesting. Now we've moved back to a, a different venue, which um, I, ca I, can find, I can't find anything even on the internet about it anymore, but it was the 23rd Street YMCA in Manhattan. And there was a fellow named Bernie Pearl who produced these concerts and he, 
he liked my work and he asked me to come shoot the show. So, I mean, I, I photographed everyone from Don McLean, Dave, Dave Van Ronk. Um, uh, he did a lot of bluegrass shows. Uh, there was a uh, Bill Monroe and uh, the shot of my, uh, Bill Monroe ended up in the New York Times. Uh, the Don McLean show was, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, this was actually prior, just prior to American Pie hitting. And I don't know, it might've been his first time, you know, performing the song. And um, Reverend Gary Davis is a very uh, revered uh, blues artist, uh, no longer with us. But ironically, I learned after we laid out the book that Dave Van Ronk learned his guitar style from Reverend Gary Davis. So, and- It was just randomly ended up next to each other in the book. Right, right. And then I just read a, a, a thing that uh, when Dave Van Ronk was at McCabe's uh, guitar, shop and concert hall in LA that Jackson Brown came to see Dave Van Ronk and wanted to learn some of his guitar style. And, and of course, Dave Van Ronk said, oh, I learned it from Reverend Gary Davis. So interesting lineage there. Awesome. Uh, Nina Simone, yeah. legend. Um, talk to me a little bit about the series of photos of Nina and where they were taken and um, what they were ended up used being used for and, 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 uh, you know, your relationship with, with her in these photos. Right. Well, this is interesting because this, these were at the village gate. Um, and, and all these, all these venues down in the village were within walking distance of one another. And they were different sizes from, you know, really small intimate rooms to village gate was a little larger. Um, I actually don't know how many people it, it held, held or holds. Um, but, um, Nina was Nina, of course, was outstanding, and I had also seen her and photographed her at the Fillmore East, where uh, Richie Havens opened for her. But these, the first photo here, it's it's very interesting. I can show you um, later on in the late '80s. I got hired to shoot an album cover for her with Verve Polygram um, called "Let It Be Me," and you'll see that photo later on in the in the presentation. We have it, yeah. Okay, and um, but the thing is, they used that photo from like 1971 in this album that came out in '87, as if these these were done at the same time, which of course they were not. So, but so the, the photos got some mileage there. But but you know, the cool thing is, is that I got to do the album cover for Nina, and then she liked it enough, apparently, that she called me um, in the '90s and uh, asked me to come do a private session for her. And, uh, you know, all the pictures I did from the album cover and those later pictures, uh, she used the later pictures in her biography and she used those pictures for promo, you know, until the day she died. So that was quite an honor. The other thing that was happening in Greenwich Village at the time were a bunch of little small clubs. You had the Gaslight, you had the Bitter End. These are little venues that held between 50 and 100 people. Right. And so, you know, you have Bonnie Raitt here playing in, in, in one of those clubs. Chris Christopherson, I think this is at the Gaslight. Um, Chris, again, you have two different versions, one with the beard and one without. <laughs> uh, uh, John Sebastian, um, you know, Carly Simon, um, the Everly Brothers. I mean, it's just amazing to see some of these. And I think this Everly Brothers is a different venue, right? Yeah. Um, the, the other ones, the, you know, the, the shots that we were just looking at, you know, this is like, we all love to be able to say, oh my God, yeah, I saw Carly Simon with 75 people at the bitter end. You know, <laughs> yeah, I saw Chris Alverson with 50 people at the gaslight. You know, it's right. like one of those, it's, it's one of those badges of honors that we all get to wear when we discover these artists early enough to see them in these intimate settings, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, like with the Grateful Dead, people who saw them in smaller theaters in the, in the 60s and the 70s versus arenas and stadiums. And so, uh, you know, always be, it's always talking about those more intimate settings. And so, again, like this badge of honor. Um, the Everly Brothers, let's just keep kind of cruising through here. Um, and I want to remind everybody at the end of the program, you can ask Sherry questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got our intern, Joe from Relics, who is gathering questions, as well as Harrison from Relics. And you can type those questions in on YouTube or Facebook or, or fans.live where we're broadcasting and, uh, uh, and ask Sherry our questions and those folks will present them at the end of the presentation. So thanks Harrison and Joe for aggregating those. Um, but uh, 
Um, this is Jimmy Webb on piano, I believe, correct? Yes, that's at the bitter end as well. You know, and, you know it was hard making choices for the book because there were so many. And, and now there are some I wish I'd included, um, like Jerry Jeff Walker at the oh, Gaslight wow. Cafe. There were so many artists that that's, that's where they played when they right. came to New York or they lived in New York. Um, Jimmy Webb was you know, pretty much unknown, but he, there he was doing those songs that were about to become classics. So it, pretty wild. The Everly Brothers actually was at NYU. And, uh, you know, NYU, uh, it, it, the, the pictures earlier of James Taylor and, and um, Carol King and Joni Mitchell were at Queens College. So there were a lot of college concerts going on as well, I wanted to point out. Pretty typical. So Jimmy Webb also, he wrote MacArthur Park, right? Yes, yep. And then uh, also, um, um, did he write the alignment or did he just, or, or did Glenn Campbell? I he, yeah, I think he did. I mean, he wrote practically all the Glenn Campbell hits. He wrote for the Fifth Dimension, Up, Up and Away. And yeah, My Beautiful Balloon, that's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so he was, he was amazing. I, I have to say that I read a, um, you know, in going back and doing some research on, on some of these photos that I didn't have additional details about, I read that, uh, uh, and it may have been in the New York Times, he got reviewed for that show at the bitter end. And they said, you know, this guy shouldn't be out performing because he can't sing. You know, the songs are good. But, you know, <laughs> I was, I was like, Interesting. Another one of those people that's, you know, obscure in our pop culture history in some ways, but so prevalent in others because of the songs that he has written. I mean, right. just you know, truly, truly uh, amazing. And um, there's still, also a little story about oh, 74 years old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, and the little addition to the story that uh, I'll share is that uh, more recently, I I was the photographer for a concert series here in L.A. called the um, at the Levitt Pavilion. And uh, two of those years, Jimmy Webb performed. And he sounds great, by the way. He looks great. He sounds great. It's uh, he, he's just phenomenal. But um, the really cool thing is that the Levitt Pavilion has or had two because um, they just recently closed. I, I, well, the, the LA one's still open and it's in MacArthur Park. So he sang MacArthur Park in they, MacArthur Park. They gave him a cake. <laughs> you know. they, did they simulate some fake rain so he could be eating the cake in the rain? The song is the most bizarre <laughs> song ever. I mean, it's just like you listen to that song and what? it's so infectious, but it's also the most bizarre lyrics. And the it's most, totally you know, bizarre. It's totally bizarre. So, so strange, but anyway, moving moving on from yeah. uh, from from that, we have Ian and Sylvia, um, of course, the famous um, uh, folk duo. Uh, yes, and, and I Wade, just Wade, Catherine O'Hara. Um, yes, okay, yes, they were they were satirized in Mighty Wind, um, thoroughly satirized, but they were seriously. Um, they were also recording like Joni Mitchell songs. They were the first, they had an album called The Circle Game. Uh, they recorded Leonard Cohen. They were, you know, all those songs were drifting in and out of the repertoires of all these different folk artists at the time. But yeah, they were, and they were very influential to me because I just, I, not only were they folk artists, but I loved, I loved their harmonies. I loved what, and I loved the, there was a lot of uh, really pictorial kind of songs about Canada. And I thought I wanted, I, I thought I wanted to move to Canada. Yeah, also really important uh, because they were very close friends with Gordon Lightfoot. Right. And Gordon Lightfoot, uh, I believe they also recorded Early Morning Rain. Oh yeah, yeah. And they were the ones who actually introduced uh, Gordon to Albert Grossman, who managed Bob Dylan, and then Albert Grossman started managing Gordon Lightfoot, and essentially, you know, got Gordon into the American market. And and uh, I actually just read the Gordon Lightfoot biography. <laughs> just literally finished it a couple of weeks ago. And you have time to read. <laughs> so I learned a lot about Ian and Sylvia, um, and 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 uh, the connection and the Canadian stuff. And so, just you know, again, really important in in the folk genre. Um, right. And then at that at this point, and you may notice that uh, Ian in one of the photographs is playing a, a Fender Telecaster, and that was because they were just moving into from from folk to folk rock. They're an electric band. 
Yeah. So there's a pedal steel off to the left of the picture. They had just recorded an album in Nashville called Nashville. And they had put together this group called the Great Speckled Bird that a lot of great players came out of. Um, but it was kind of the demise of their career. Their fans could not seem to follow them in down this path. It was kind of like, you know, on a, on a smaller level, it was like, you know, when, when Dylan went electric at, at Newport at the Newport Folk Festival. I mean, people were like, oh my God, they're plugging in, you know? So, so well, it was a shame. Shot here of Ian Sylvia, just a, you know, a, a, a gimmicky lens in front of your lens that gave you kind of a multiple. Oh gosh, yes. Well, you know, just just in my personal history, you know, like you were saying, Jay, you were self taught, self taught, as I was uh, photographically. I went to school for music, but I was self taught as far as my um, uh, anything I did photographically, and and I did things like. Uh, I thought the way to crop photographs were, were, was to cut the negatives, you know, <laughs> to the subject. I mean, just really, really horrible mistakes, you know, like don't give me a pair of scissors. Um, but another thing I did was, you know, while I was doing, I was a child who did mail order, apparently. That's how I got the uh, inflatable boat. And I also ordered this, uh, what was a multiple image filter from a place called place called the Edmund Scientific Factory. Yeah, a little, a little gimmicky, but fun. It was gimmicky. And what was, but the irony of it is here's this picture of Ian and Sylvia that actually got published in Crawdaddy magazine, which at that time was another underground music magazine that was, you know, really popular. And they chose that and, you know, had, you know, 10 Ian and Sylvia's. And at this point also, you're still in New York, but you're, you are no longer shooting for Corpus newspaper and you're shooting for a magazine called the rock magazine is that what it was called ah rock magazine yes i i i think corpus went out of business or i would have been shooting for them um oh. yeah i mean you know some of those underground papers really came and went uh but there was a uh publication called rock magazine and it wasn't really a magazine because it was uh newsprint but um i started shooting for them and uh, interestingly, one of the uh, people who worked in the office was Lenny Kay. He was a writer for Rock Magazine, who of course ended up with Patti Smith, as a guitar player. And uh, but you know, it was it was a thrill for me because I got my name on the masthead of Rock Magazine. Even if I wasn't making more money, I was published regularly, and um, you know, there I was. It gave it gave me access to a lot of uh, a lot of venues, a lot of concerts, a lot of artists that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to. Let's go breeze through some photographs here before we get uh, too far behind. Um, yes. So uh, Janice Joplin, uh, was this at Farce Hills? Yes, yes. So this was, I think Hills, it was so mere months before she, you know, OD'd. Right, and so this is right in your old neighborhood where you grew up. Right, uh, and it was the first time, it was the first time I'd ever been to Farce Hills Tennis Stadium. It wasn't for tennis, it was for Joplin. And so Janice, and then of course, Lou Reed in the Velvet Underground. Right. And I love these photographs and they're, you know, you look at these photographs and you're like, oh, they're kind of blurry and they're kind of weird. But people have to remember that it was basically pitch black. And yeah. that the only light on the band was these projections that Andy Warhol was projecting on the screen behind where you can sort of see in the shot here and you can see where Lou, Lou Reed's hand is blurry because it's a slow shutter speed. Right. But, uh, again, you know, no digital camera. You couldn't just view it on your viewfinder. You actually had to understand that the light was low and compensate in your exposure as well as your development when you pushed your film. I mean, you know, when we were shooting film back in the day, you actually needed to have these, you know, very different technical skills than you do than you need to have today with a computer. Right. Um, you know, as far as the camera in your hand, when you're shooting with a digital camera, you can review what you're shooting and make adjustments very quickly. Whereas, um, you know, versus the post-production side of things. Whereas when you had a camera, you needed to understand how to expose that film properly or you would walk away with nothing. Right, and, yeah. and do a lot of hoping and praying. Yeah, here's a, here's a little triptych of Lou from that same show. Uh, right. Little Richard, um, great shot of him with this this towel as a skirt i don't know if it's a skirt it's a, it's a towel and and it's paisley pants i mean it was just like well and that that brings us to the next picture too these are shot at um a part of madison square garden now that um it was called it is called the felt forum it still exists and um uh they would have rock shows there 
And interestingly enough, you got you got little Richard in his towel and paisley pants. But the next shot is of Bo Diddley. And Bo Diddley, the story about this was kind of interesting, <laughs> kind of funny, that his children, he, he had come to the gig, his children came to see him. And he, Bo always dressed, you know, like to the nines in his suit and his tie and all that. And apparently they looked at him and said, dad, you know, that's just not very hip. You know, you're, you're playing, you know, this is not the sixties anymore and you know, whatever, whatever. So the, the true story is that Bo went out and bought himself a tie dye outfit. And so you see these pictures and he's in full tie dye regalia. It's like, it's hysterical. And then this next shot here of Bo Diddley is... Um, the Association. Of the Association, right. Right, right, right. Association. And this was on the same show, same, same bill? There were two different shows. Um, they were actually being packaged as an oldie show, even though, um, you know, the, the, the Association was, wasn't really an oldies act at that, that point. They had, you know, in recent years, they'd had hits with Never My Love and Cherish and Along Comes Mary. And, and um, they were, anyway, an amazing group, an amazing group. For sure. Just and they still tour, you know, know different, different bands. Bubble, pop bubble gum of the late 60s. So we get into a series of photographs here. Now we're moving into like the Fillmore East and the Capitol Theater in Portchester, which is sort of our home base here at fans.live. Um, so we have, you know, Zappa and the Mothers of Invention at the, at the Fillmore East. And, uh, you know, here's the Grateful Dead at the Capitol Theater in Portchester. And we have Laura Nairo at the, uh, L Laura Nairo. 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 Thank you. Sorry. Laura <laughs> Nero. I knew that. I don't know why I came out wrong. <laughs> at, at, the, at the Fillmore and um, Dave Mason and, and Mama Cass Elliott together. And so now because, you know, Ian Anderson of, of um, uh, Jethro Tull, John Kay of Steppenwolf, um, you know, here's B.B. King at the Brooklyn Community College, maybe, right? Yep. Yep. Another college concert. Right. And so now you're maybe shooting slightly bigger shows because you're getting published more regularly in rock magazine and it's easier for you to call up these publicists and be like, Hey, I want to cover your show for rock magazine. And boom, they gave you credentials. Is that correct? Yes. And, and I was, you know, it was not just rock magazine. It was cream and crawdaddy and all the early rock uh, publications. Um, and basically any, any music publication I could, could get into, you know, the, especially that was based in New York, which they right. were, fortunately. And then B.B. King, which is just great. I mean, you know, B.B. Mm -hmm. King in the, in the late 60s, early 70s is just so, so classic and amazing. Uh, Delaney and Bonnie, who, of course, you know, gained great fame, uh, you know, playing with Clapton and playing with Joe Cocker and Mad Dogs of Englishmen and all that kind of stuff. You know, the other thing that I love about something like this, and most people wouldn't even notice this, is that if you look at the microphone that, Bonnie is singing into, there's actually two microphones right next to each other. And that's because one of those microphones I'm guessing is going into something that they're recording the show on either it's a, a huh. radio broadcast or the recording, it, recording it with a recording studio or a truck or some mobile equipment of some sort. You know, nowadays they can take a microphone and they put it into a splitter and it can go out to the sound system at the concert as well as into a recording console. Right. But back then, that technology didn't exist. So like you can literally see there's two microphones that are duct taped, you know, together and you can see it over on, on, on Delaney as well. He has two, it's a little bit weird. We're not as good of an angle to see that, but this was a very common thing. And, 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 you know, one of the first people to sort of invent the technology to get away from that was the Grateful Dead. When they did the Grateful Dead movie in 1974, they sort of built these weird little microphones. If you go back and watch the Grateful Dead movie, it's like a little square box with two like little pencil like things coming out. And those were sort of the two microphones in that box had some sort of um, canceling, you know, phase canceling system that the geniuses of the Grateful Dead, Dan Healy and Owsley Stanley created to, to do it properly. But um, uh, until then, this was like a common sight at, wow. you know, early concerts. I yeah. love this photograph of Pop Staples and the Staples Singers with Mavis over there at the end. I mean, just, you know, the wardrobe, the hairdos. I mean, this is just such a, Again, such so classic, you know, pop history and mm -hmm. Curtis Mayfield right after that. And what was the show that the Pop Staples Curtis Mayfield show was oh, at? This was actually a um, television taping. And I honestly don't know what the show was, except that it was the Staples Singers, Curtis Mayfield and the Impressions and, and a few other acts, including um, 
Carolyn Franklin, who was Aretha Franklin's sister. And uh, it was just a magnificent opportunity to, to, I was, you know, I was the only photo photographer there. So these, uh, these pictures have really stood the test of time. And the cool thing, obviously, is that it was on a TV set. So yay, good lighting. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, a, a little dark, you know, it wasn't in Max's Kansas City with the Velvet Underground, which incidentally, those shows, I think they, that it was a, a series of shows that went on for several weeks and they were the last, very last shows that Lou Reed played with the Velvet Underground. Interesting. Uh, all right. So now we enter a brand new phase in your life. We're in Los Angeles with Elton John and Kiki D at the Roxy, a little tiny club. But first, um, you decide to leave New York and you throw a backpack on essentially with your camera and you hitchhike across country by yourself. Did you do that? Yes, I did. And say, I'm moving to Los Angeles. Yes. And this is the early 70s. Is the 70 or 71? 71. Okay, 1971. And you hitchhike a lone single woman uh, across <laughs> country just in time to get uh, connect with Rock Magazine and the LA Bureau because they have an LA version of the magazine. They put right. you on the last head there. Yes. And Boom, you're automatically in the scene with credentials at the Roxy. It's a Kiki D show that Elton comes and sits in with her. Of course, they made it into a giant hit. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, this is a new phase in your life. What's right. going on? What are you thinking? Why did you make that move? Well, I was hearing a lot of music that I just, uh, you know, not just caught my ear, but I wanted to play this kind of music. Uh, I wanted to be uh, in the, in the, uh, area just, you know, where these musicians were making this music. I mean, a lot of it was um, a little before my time, like the 60s, like the Birds and Poco and um, Buffalo Springfield. I loved these bands and I loved the sounds of the guitars and I loved the pedal steel. And, and uh, you know, I wasn't at all into country music, but it, it sounded very different than the country music that that we had grown up listening to. And it was so much hipper and it was so cool. And Roger McGuinn with his 12 string and, and, uh, but as I say, that was, you know, that was really, they were having their heyday uh, in the sixties, mid and late sixties. Um, so I just, you know, I heard about Laurel Canyon and I, I actually had an album by Jackie D. Shannon, you know, what the world needs now is love and put a little love in your heart. I had an album, a new album by her at the time or newer that was called Laurel Canyon. And there she was standing, you know, here, uh, you know, again, it's like, I just love the images of, of the artists. And she's, uh, she's got a fringe jacket on and she's standing in front of her house. Um, obviously in Laurel Canyon, I'm going, man, that's cool. You know, I mean, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get away from New York City. I wanted to see some greenery. And it was like, I, wow, you could live in a canyon. You know, you could live with trees and, you know, not be in the midst of this hustle, hustle and bustle of, of you know, uh, people everywhere in New York. So, um, so I came out here for the music, you know, and I had one friend, her name was Carol uh, Carmichael. And then she married a, a very famous guitar player named Dean Parks, who ended up playing with Steely Dan and, and plays with like everybody from Barbara Streisand on down. But um, Carol was the only person I knew in LA and she invited me out here. And, you know, I had nothing literally except, um, you know, the backpack on my back and uh, and with a camera in it, of course. And uh, uh, so she started taking me around to, she was doing a lot of recording sessions. She And she'd get me hired to take pictures or, or you know, I wrote liner notes or played an auto harp track or did anything. So that's that was my start in LA. And she set me up, not in Laurel Canyon, but a canyon called Beachwood Canyon, which also, I mean, literally Linda Ronstadt lived a couple of uh, streets away from me. And, and there were John David Sowell, there, there were all these musicians there too, even though Laurel Canyon became, you know, obviously the-, the, um, the famous. I have a question for you. Um, and for, and I think I mentioned this early on, you know, um, Sherry has been a photographer since the sixties. Um, she's also been a musician since then. As you can see, she's got three good, beautiful guitars behind her there. When did you go electric? <laughs> That's very funny because what I did was, I, I don't know what year, my, my mom bought me a, uh, well, 
you know, I had a really funky, cheap electric guitar my mom bought me. And then, and then um, we, out of the, the local buy and sell paper, which, you know, then out here was called the recycler and now everything's online, of course, but um, uh, we found a used Fender Jazz Master guitar. And um, uh, what's interesting about it is that it, it wasn't the, well, Pop Staples played one in that picture. He's playing a jazz master. But, you know, it's only in recent years or recent decades, I should say, that the jazz master became so popular again. Because oh, yeah. at some point along the way, uh, I had this jazz master and I wanted to sell it. You know, I wanted to get a, a Telecaster, you know, that was much cooler and hipper and for country music and country rock. And I couldn't sell it. Nobody wanted it, you know. And, uh, <laughs> And now it's, of course, you know, now Fender has reissued those and they yeah. make them better than ever. They look so cool. All right, let's, let's, um, let's cruise through some photographs here as you, you get into L.A. Yeah. First of all, the incredible, brilliant Karen Carpenter. I mean, yeah. come on, like, who, who fucking doesn't love the Carpenters? Um, you know, I don't yeah. care, all you closet deadheads out there, you love the <laughs> I love the Carpenters. Look at Thank Richard. you, Jay. Thank you. Well, yeah, that, that was a really funny one, too, because, um, oh, yeah. And actually, I, I saw a show uh, just, I don't know, half a dozen years ago. Uh, it was a tribute at the Hollywood Bowl. They were inducting the Carpenters into the Hollywood Bowl Hall of Fame. And and uh, Donna Summer was on the bill. It was just a little before she passed away. And she was telling stories. And she said, you know, nobody would have expected me to love the carpenters like i love the carpenters and she said i raised my kids on the carpenters they were in the back seat singing carpenter songs and um you know it was unfortunate for them i mean it never stopped them i mean their popularity was huge but the you know of course the stigma was that they were just totally white bread totally homogenized totally you know unhip but everybody was a car closet carpenters fan you yeah. know and um you know, my best friend came to L.A. and I wanted to take her someplace, you know, someplace that, she, you know, for music, we could go to concert, a concert that she would really like. But my friend Jackie, I mean, she's as radical as they come, you know, and she and she's black. And she's like, you know, I see this this ad in the L.A. Free Press or something that the Carpenters were playing that night at, at the Greek theater. And I'm thinking, like, do I dare mention the Carpenters playing? You know, is she could, you know, and I mentioned it to her and she goes, I love the Carpenters. <laughs> and I'm going, let me see if I can get credentials because I want to go shoot that show too. And without the, without her saying yes, I love the Carpenters, I wouldn't even have um, gotten where some. Where are from, from that, that Greek show? Yeah, well, they're, they're, these are two different shows. Uh, one's a couple of years later or a year and a half later at the uh, Hollywood Bowl. Right. Um, so, you know, it's funny when we all thought we were too cool, we would put the Carpenters on at the end of the night when our parties were winding down. So we'd say, you put the Carpenters on, people would leave, you know? <laughs> I think I probably did it because I loved it so much. All right, we have Joni Mitchell in a recording studio. We have Joan Baez in a recording studio um, with some Mexican, Latino musicians. What is she recording here? And how did you end up in a recording studio with these people? Well, what what's, uh, you know, pretty phenomenal about these opportunities. I had I had a friend who produced concerts. She produced concerts at the uh, club here called the Ashgrove. She um, she was politically involved. She was uh, she was just a cool person. And she was a friend of mine and she loved my work. So she'd get me hired any time she could uh, to shoot shows. And she w happened to have been a friend of producer Henry Louis. And I mean, he's, Henry Louis was amazing. And he was, he worked out primarily out of a and Studios. And a and Studios was such a incredibly, it was a pioneering label because it wasn't, a label that was just a rock label or just a folk label or a jazz label. They were just all about good music. You know, it was started by um, Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. And uh, they, man, they just, they were all, they were just about the, the passion of releasing great music. So um, what ended up happening was because my friend knew Henry Louie, she started inviting me to a, a few sessions uh, with his permission. And just happened to be the Joni Mitchell session was when she was recording Court and Spark. And there were no photographers there. And I knew that it, it was such an intimate and, uh, you know, room 
that it was, you know, I, I literally had to just quickly shoot a few shots because I couldn't resist. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't hold back. And she was actually recording Court and Spark there. And but, um, there aren't I, any other pictures of that. A little bit. So um, I believe this is Henry Louis at the mixing board with Graham Nash. And uh, yes, yes, yes. Moving right along. Yes. And Joan Baez, that was recording uh, Gracias a la Vida, which is a very right. famous album of hers. There. Okay, got it. Yes. And then Graham Nash, she, he was there for uh, Leah Kunkel's the recording of Leah Kunkel's album, and then Leah Kunkel being um, Cass Elliot's sister. Right, of course, yep. And so that's the, and that's Henry Louis there, who you were talking about. And then yeah. here's Graham again with Leah singing together. Yes. Carl Simon, uh, where's this show at? Uh, that, uh, the Graham and Leah? Oh, the uh, Carly Simon. Oh, Carly Simon. Oh, we're moving into the, the section on the Troubadour. And, okay. uh, that's, all right, that's what I thought. So, yeah. so the Troubadour, of course, a very, very famous venue, Doug Weston's Troubadour. So <laughs> many incredible shows there. Uh, if you saw the Elton John uh, biopic, you know you can uh, uh, see that you know he did his some early shows at the Troubadour. So many people. I mean, Ground Zero for you know you know everybody from Linda Ronstadt to the Eagles to JT to Jackson Brown. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young guys, all of these people, J.D. Souther, et cetera. Um, so we have Carly Simon. You have Linda Ronstadt here at the at the Troubadour. Roger McGuinn of The Birds. I'm guessing this is maybe one of his solo projects at this point in the early 70s. Uh, McGuinn, yeah, it was, uh, uh, McGuinn was performing solo, and then David Crosby got up. Oh, right, and then David yeah. Crosby on stage with them, you know, which, of course, if you pay attention out there, you know, these guys, you know, David keeps asking Roger if he could play with him again and do something with the birds and Roger nope, is, nope, nope. is ignoring him. <laughs> right, and I know. Bette Midler, the legendary Bette Midler at the Troubadour. And didn't the Troubadour hold just a few hundred people, like 400 people, 500 people? Yeah, but, between three and four, I think, you know, and it used to be a sit down place. They had rows of tables and then, you know, they have a small balcony. And I, yeah, I mean, it had started out as a folk club back in, you know, early 60s and again, went to folk rock in the in the uh, mid mid to late 60s. And I was not there for that. But then when I came out here, that was the destination for any, oh. uh, you know, popular act that was happening then. So, yeah, the Pointer Sisters, Bill Withers, um, Delaney well, then, Bramlett, uh, because he and Bonnie had split by then. Um, and Jimmy Buffett first, right? Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. Oh yeah. Well, where there's Jimmy Buffett, who I looked at that picture. I had no idea that was Jimmy Buffett, of course. And then, uh, Doug Som. Yeah. Right? Sir Douglas Quintet. Yep. Right. And then, uh, Little Feet, there's Lowell and, and Paul, yep. uh, you know, peak, peak Little Feet. This is like 74 ish, something like that. Yep. Yep, it is. Like, I mean, if anybody who knows anything about Little Feet, I mean, that 74 was the year. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, and then this is, um, uh, this is Delaney in the recording studio. Yes. With a big what? ashtray full of cigarette butts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You need that to, to, to be creative. Uh, and then who's this? Oh, this is Mance Lipscomb. Uh, Lipscomb, yeah. who I don't really know much about. Um, what's his story? Okay, he was, you know, he was in the era of um, Reverend Gary Davis, these great blues guys that came out of the South. And um, there were not, you know, in on the West Coast or in LA, there were not very many places for them to play, to be, afford to come out here and play. And Ed Pearl started the Ash Grove and he welcomed these acts. He based his, uh, you know, his following on these great blues acts that you couldn't see anywhere else. Um, I mean, McCabe's ended up doing some of that too, but um, the Ash Grove was, you know, had very strong political leanings and literally got burned down two or three times. The last time was, you know, that was the end of it. But a lot of these same artists, and I didn't put the pictures in there because I had already had them in in different venues but roger mcguinn chris christopherson rita coolidge all these pl people played at the ash grove as well and um this just happened to be it's an it's an homage to the ash grove here amazing yeah and then we have linda ronstadt with the with the impeached nixon you know <laughs> band, which i love you know i still think it's important for our artists with this platform to get out and speak their minds um politically i think it's important yep. that it's part of the cultural conversation. 
Um, yeah. Love these shots of Linda. You know, again, now we're you know we're we're, we're in the early seventies, mid seventies. Yeah. You know, the metal studs on the shorts, on the hot the hot pants. I mean, do you remember the whole metal stud craze? You know, you could buy kits and do your jean jacket. Uh, beautiful photograph of Emmy Lou Harris, um, Emmy Lou Young with dark hair. Uh, here's Emmy Lou again with uh, who's oh, that's Rodney Crowell over there on the right on guitar. Rodney Crowell, Rodney Crowell on the left, yeah. Uh, so well, on the on her right, our left. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> he's there. He's there. He's in the picture. Um, yeah. And the bass player is Emery Gordy, who became a very um, prominent. Uh, country music producer, and then the the photograph of her with the tambourine. That's James Burton uh, playing guitar behind her. Uh, he oh, was wow. in her original Hot Band before. Um, James, before Albert Lee. Is that what you said, James Burton. James Burton, who played with, uh, started out playing Elvis Presley. <laughs> wow, okay, very cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, Emmy Lou and Rodney got back together and started making a few. They made a few records in the last decade or so, and I think it was about. I don't know, seven or eight years ago, they made their first record together and I got hired to photograph them. Uh, oh, wow. for Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I, I was down in Austin at South by Southwest and they were as well. And I oh. brought them to the photo studio and did a portrait of Emmy Lou and, and Rodney together for the for the cover of Acoustic Guitar. Uh, another beautiful, oh, there's the Emmy Lou with the James Byrne behind it with the tambourine. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't catch that it was the next photo. <laughs> uh, I just love that. And uh uh, you know, Jerry Garcia loved James Burton and uh, they got to jam together here in the Bay Area in 1989. I was at a private Christmas party. And I got to photograph. It was Jerry Garcia, Elvis Costello and James Burton. On stage. Oh, my, oh, my God. I have a uh, funny, I have a, ch a funny Jerry. I mean, you're the you're the, the king of the Grateful Dead. I mean, I even hesitated putting that picture in there because I went, oh, you know, that's not going to hold up the Jay's shots. Uh, but um, but almost an homage to you, actually. But uh uh, you know, it, it, yeah, it was just, it was interesting. I, I was in a band, uh, out here in the seventies and we, we played up in the, in the Bay area, uh, quite a bit. And, uh, we played at, uh, in Palo Alto for this, uh, radio broadcast called the fat fry K fat radio station. Sure. And, um, so <laughs> we, my band opened for Jerry Garcia and I was, I was like, it was a time in my life. I went in and out of this weird time where I went, you know, if I'm playing music, I'm a musician, I'm not a photographer. So, you know, I, I don't want to whip out a camera. So I literally was sitting backstage tuning my guitar next to Jerry Garcia tuning his guitar. And oh. but no pictures. I went, no, 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 no. I'm not going to interrupt this or, you know, be obtrusive. Okay, it's a good memory. Uh, yeah. Of course, the legendary Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry again. Yes. Uh, and then we get into the Bee Gees. Um, you know, just uh, let's see here, right? We're at the Bee Gees, and um, this was a big concert at the at the LA Memorial Coliseum Stadium, like a all day, all weekend thing with uh, Barry Gibb and and Stevie Wonder played. I love that bow tie that Stevie yeah. Wonder <laughs> with that that sweater vest. You know, I mean, just like so classic. I mean, you know, the the '70s fashion, giant collars on it underneath his bow tie there. And then I love these photographs of Sly Stone. I mean, you know, I got to photograph Sly once at a small club in New Jersey called the Stone Pony and oh, yeah. Asbury Park. And, and, you know, the band came on, the band plays for about 30 or 40 minutes before he even comes on stage. He comes on stage, plays three songs, and then he leaves. And then the band, you know, the band, I think yeah. I have one photograph from that show. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's funny when I was looking through these. Well, first of all, I love I love his name on the guitar and all his you know all his fashion, uh, quite a fashionista. Uh, um, but then I found that one shot where he is just looking straight at me. I don't know if you have that there, but it, but yeah, it, I don't have that one. Yeah, we have this other yeah, one. It's, it's in the book. <laughs> but this I, I should say about this show, um, all these uh, there are all these amazing acts on on this on this bill, and. Um, it was uh, it was a benefit, I think, it put on by K Rock out here uh, radio station, and it was. But something there were so many acts. The show went on. Uh, I've heard for like fourteen hours. <laughs> it was not a weekend show. It was all in one day, and um, and it was funny because when I was doing a little research about it to to remember a little bit more about some of these photographs, I saw that the Eagles. Blade. And I went, wow, why don't I put photographs from the Eagles uh, for the Miss Show? And the story was that in their contract, it was like they were not going to go on past a certain time. And it had already been 14 hours, so they left. 
<laughs> they have to play and they probably probably still got their money. So yep. uh, the same show here at this this big stadium show where Sly Stone played. Keith Moon was the MC. Uh, they, they had different MCs, but he definitely MC'd, as you can see. He was one of the MCs. Uh, uh, we have Brand Funk Railroad. Yep. Um, and then Bonnie Raitt. Um, and Bonnie's a Bonnie's a different venue now. We're we're at a uh, venue called the Coconut Grove here, at the Ambassador Hotel, which is of course where unfortunately um, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. But there was a beautiful showroom there that had been there for decades. That a lot of you know the the early crooners and jazz artists played. But then they started having some you know like pop music shows, and they had Tina Turner, and they had Bonnie Raitt, and uh, uh, just just a great great venue. So we get into this series of photographs and I'm going to kind of flip back and forth while you tell the story, but it's all women. It's an all, all women, a couple of bands, uh, uh, right. Bertha and Fanny, was it? Um, yep. And so tell me the story about these women and what the, what, what the deal was and where you shot these and why they're important to the, to your story and your book. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, well, First of all, you know, that at the time of the very first pioneering of uh, female bands, I mean, female bands were a novelty, you know, that's what the, how they were looked at and they weren't taken seriously. And it was all about, you know, uh, you know, playing like girls and whatever. But these two bands, these girls kicked ass. They were great rock players, great rock vocalists, both four piece bands, both with multiple lead singers. And, um, and both of them got record deals, which was incredible. You know, uh, Fanny was on Warner Brothers. Um, they were produced by Richard Perry. Um, and I think later Todd Rundgren and um, Bertha was on a label called ABC Dunhill. They both toured Europe. They did TV shows. So Fanny, Fanny got more acclaim, you know, and they and uh, uh, th so they ended up, you know, recording more albums. But they, both groups were just exceptional. Did they, did they inspire you to rock, like, as a musician? Did they, like, inspire you as a musician as well? Yeah, but I could never keep up with that. <laughs> they were they were really, they, they were exceptional players. And, um, you know, the, uh, in Bertha, uh, Rosemary Butler was the bass player, and Rosemary kind of got discovered by Bonnie Raitt. And uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately for Rosemary, but unfortunately for Bertha, she left the band and it fell apart because she became... Um, Bonnie Raitt's uh, backup singer and later became, you know, sang, she sung for years with Ronstadt and James Taylor, all these people. She's done solo work. She's a, she's an amazing, amazing singer, but she was a great bass player. And um, they did all orig mostly original music. And, uh, you know, uh, I think it's, there's going to be a documentary coming out. I think it's called Fan maybe Fanny Rocks comes out in 2021 about them uh i you know of course have a picture in there and and a couple of these pictures were used on the back of one of fanny's album covers um and uh you know and and they reformed as a matter of fact as fanny walks the earth um about three years ago and they got signed to blue elon records which is the same label that my band mustangs of the west is on awesome. so and and, Must and and blue elon is a label they've got rita coolidge they've got jerry beckley of america they've got a wide variety they've got a lot of young artists um and and the the founder kirk passage who founded blue elon records wanted to do it in in uh the same style as a m records that you know, where it would be about all styles of music, all ages, um, very unusual in, in, in our musical climate. All right. all right, let's cruise through some photos again here um, so we don't get too far behind. And okay. say <laughs> questions again, we got Joe from Relics and Harrison from Relics taking questions. If you want to write them in any of the Facebook pages that are broadcasting this or YouTube or fans.live, et cetera, um, we'll answer those questions at the end. So here we have Cool in the Gang, which I believe was a, also, uh, maybe a television broadcast of some sort. Um, uh, yeah, it was uh, Don Cap Don Kirshner's rock concert. Don Kirshner's rock concert, the yeah. famous, the famous Don Kirshner. Al yeah. Green. Uh, yeah, Al's. Al Green, Al Jarreau. Uh, yeah. You know, Phoebe Snow, uh, Judy Collins again. Somebody who came back to over and over again. I love the shot of Paul Simon when he had that '70s hairdo. Hell yeah. <laughs> Somewhere, I mean, he was such a one of a kind, but of course, Paul Simon, just absolutely incredible. Uh, Janice Ian, 
um, Patty Smith. So you're moving into something a little bit rocker. Uh, Tom Waits, just incredible. Here's Bette Midler again. Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, Graham Nash sitting in with Peter, Paul, and Mary, but but um, Paul is missing. I believe that's Peter, right? Peter Yarrow. Yeah, that was just, it was like an encore. But, but the interesting thing about these photographs, I think that um, you might want to be aware of is that uh, this was now, you know, we'd moved on from the anti-Vietnam, the anti-war era. Now we're the anti-nuke era. This is Survival Sunday, correct? Survival Sunday. And Survival Sunday went on for several years. Um, I, I photographed it three years, but there was another one that Springsteen did. And um, uh, which interestingly enough, after I left New York, Springsteen, I think also did uh, the Schaefer Music Festival. Um, so I personally have never gotten to see him, but these concerts uh, were organized uh, by Peter Yarrow and uh, at least in the beginning and um, just an amazing, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash, all, all the uh, John Denver, a lot of the same artists again, uh, performing, uh, speaking up, you know, speaking their minds and uh, it was amazing. amazing this, this is also sort of the, the, the seed was got, got planted for Graham Nash and Bonnie Raitt and, and John Hall, uh, James Taylor, et cetera, to start the Muse organization, Musicians United for Earth Energy which was also the no nukes uh, uh, thing that happened in the late seventies. Uh, they did a five night run at Madison square garden where Bruce Springsteen also played. And they did something down in battery park, uh, battery city park in New York city. And then they did a big March on Washington in May of 1979, which I attended as a senior in high school. Um, and so this survival Sunday was sort of the beginning of, of that experience. Um, uh, this is Harry Chapin, I believe, right? And is this yes. also Survival Sunday or? Yes. Right, Harry Chapin, two great shots there. Uh, and then we get to Prince. Love this photograph of Prince with that, those bikini briefs that are, you know, I mean, and, and this was this was like a, a show at the Roxy or somewhere small or a small Yeah, venue. this was um, actually uh, his first show in LA and he had a hit song actually on the R&B charts at that point, I think a number one song. But um, it was his introduction to L.A. and a, a friend of mine, a, a comedian uh, named Judy Carter, was opening for him. And I was doing a lot of pictures for her. So she said, can you come down and shoot my show? <laughs> and so we didn't know who Prince really was. So we took pictures backstage. I shot the pictures on stage. Uh, he was wild. And I mean, that was the beginning of it all. But but um, Rolling Stone has had a field day with this picture. They've run it a number of times in special oh. issues. Uh, and then we get to the Go Go's and Belinda Carlisle, and 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 you know now now girl groups can survive and can flourish. Uh, right, they uh, were the first. They were the first to you know tour world. They were the first to have number one hits. Let's put it that way. And they, but you know when they started, and and you can see it in the documentary about them, and some of these pictures are in the documentary, but. Um, they were terrible. They didn't. They didn't know how to play their instruments. They were very different from Bertha and Fanny. I mean, <laughs> you know, but they learned as they went, and and they became a very very respectful band. You know, a lot of people, you know, don't respect them that much, but I think they deserve it. And uh, you know, they're they're getting their due again now, so which is great. And then we get back to a couple more Prince photographs, which is just again mind blowing. And I believe this was like a record release party for Purple Rain. <laughs> This was a film release party for Purple Rain. It was the movie premiere. This is five years after I shot him, uh, photographed him at the Roxy. Uh, this is 1984, just before the Purple Rain tour. And um, this was for a private uh, uh, audience of celebrities, honestly. So um, it was, uh, you know, and seeing Sheila E for the first time, but she was, I think she already was having a hit with Wonderful Life, uh, which, a glamorous life. I'm sorry, which is a song that just made me drive off the road <laughs> to listen to. So amazing! It's just such a great shot of her. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have Annie Lennox and the Arrhythmics in the early early part of their career. Cindy Lauper. Um, is that who's that after Cindy with the hat on? Is that Cindy that, again? No, that is Martha Davis and the Martha Motels. Davis, Martha and the Motels, of course, which yeah. you got to do a portrait session with. And yeah. was this? Was this for a, a, a rock magazine or was it for another magazine at this point that you were showing? Oh, no. By then, I don't think there was a rock magazine by that time. Uh, okay. No. Uh, I think they probably folded maybe, in, I don't know, in the 70s, maybe at the end of the 70s. Oh, but yeah. uh, 
eighties now, of course. Yeah, we're, we're in the yeah. So now this was this was actually for BAM magazine. Okay. And um, uh, I'm sure you shot a lot. I did. I shot yeah. covers for BAM magazine. And there and you go. There you the go. Of course. Um, but they, yes, this was. Uh, I went to Martha's house, and um, she was living in Sherman Oaks, and so we went to the Sherman Oaks Galleria <laughs> to, to shoot these pictures. But. Uh, uh, I love I love that band. I love that band. But that's at the the performance shot is at the Universal Amphitheater, and this is this is um, where you know when it was still open air. You know before they put the roof on it, and now be now it's gone. But um, it was a great venue. You know mid mid size venue to see concerts. Love the shot of Martha here with, uh, yeah. with uh, just such a great eighties look. Yeah. Uh, Richie, this is at a at the forum, correct? Okay, yeah, now a large arena. <laughs> um, yes, this so is did a you enjoy shooting in large arenas, or did you prefer the smaller venues? Oh, of course, I preferred the smaller venues. You know, because also by that time, you know, by that time there were so many more photographers shooting. It was so much more a thing that you were like jammed in with a bunch of of different guys. I, I've seen a couple of pictures. I went, oh, that's my picture. My picture got used. Well, no, it was somebody was standing right next to me who caught it like a second off. Whereas a lot of the earlier stuff, I was re just really uh, blessed to be the only photographer there. You know, because and and another thing is that a lot of you know there weren't that many female photographers, rock photographers out there. You know, on location either and. Um, a lot of the guys like you, you know, were, were shooting like the, the larger, like the Grateful Dead and, and people, large bands. And I always felt that that was covered, you know, so I didn't shoot the Led Zeppelins and the Stones and, the, you know, maybe I should, but I, I kind of followed my heart. I followed um, at my heart in terms of uh, what resonated with me musically and that I wanted to capture and, and document. And so a lot of these artists were uh, that weren't bands. They were individuals. You know, they were you know like like Lionel or or uh, Tina or uh, Cindy Lauper. They were they weren't as much bands. Is what was I'm saying. Tina, was Tina the opening act for Lionel Richie? On yes, that? yes. But but I guess it, it it had been the tour had been booked, and then all of a sudden, pow! She hit with what's like got to do with it. So she could have been the headliner. Right, right. So, but amazing, and I love this photograph, the one that we use in the promo for this. Uh, yeah. yeah we're doing today but this is just such an incredible shot of her just so much energy and and uh just beautiful and then of course her rocking out you know in in her fishnets and whatnot uh, and then of course she came back out and and either lionel came out and sang with her or she came and sang with lionel Do you one or the other i can't remember <laughs> and then uh and then who is this here this is um uh this is Etta James. Etta James. Okay, got it. Right. Etta was at the, uh, she did a residency, actually. Um, she had, you know, she had had some drug issues and she was on the road to recovery. And she did a residency at a small jazz club called the Vine Street Bar and Grill. And a friend of mine was booking the place. I actually ran lights a little bit there at the, uh, nice. at the venue. But they had, I mean, they had everybody from Etta James. And, uh, uh, they had Nina Simone there. They had, um, you know, so many wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, so the, those two pictures are from that. And, and one of the pictures I shot was uh, Etta chose for her biography called Rage to Live. And then we get uh, Ella Fitzgerald with the Manhattan Transfer. Yes. Uh, sitting around a piano, just a very classic, classic. That was cool. And then again, they're maybe rehearsing for like a, an award ceremony here. Is that that what's is the, it's the Grammys. And... Okay. Um, I was hired by their, their manager to come shoot. And, you know, we, you know, we never think about it at the time that we were going to lose Ella and she's such an incredibly uh, iconic, uh, jazz artist. And so, I mean, so I know the, the, the members of the transfer really have treasured this, these pictures as well as I have, but the first is around the grand piano where they rehearsed. And uh, that was a difficult picture to get because there was no light in the room again. And Ella's uh, eyes were very sensitive. That's why she's wearing the dark glasses. So mm -hmm. that, that was a tricky one. And then they uh, got on stage to rehearse their part and, and the, the actual end telecast that it, you can watch it on YouTube. And the Manhattan Transfer have gone on to become friends of yours, and you've worked with them over the years. Including I have. I have. I've done various shoots. Various 
are these four people the exact same four people that are in the shot with Ella? Um, the oh the the color shot is, is uh, no I'm three out of four because their founder Tim Hauser who's in the shot with Ella passed away a few uh -huh. just a few years ago and so um, but the other three are original and and they've carried on amazingly. Bob Dylan and Joan Baez at a Peace Sunday rally. Yeah, Peace Sunday kind of took the place of uh, uh, of Survival Sunday at the Rose Bowl, even an even bigger venue than than the Hollywood Bowl. So, and is that where this is also with backstage with Peter Paul and Mary? Is that also Peace Sunday? No, actually, this is at the Music Center for a okay. show they did there, and um, uh, it was just absolutely. We'll see you in the background in the mirror there over over. Yes, yes. It, it was just absolutely remarkable to be in that, you know, those close quarters with Peter, Paul and Mary singing, you know, with very few people in the room and they're rehearsing and uh, unforgettable. And this is the 80s. So we're 20, 25 years after you started seeing them as a teenager with your mom. Right. right. Um, Ricky Lee Jones. And this is at McCabe's Guitar Shop. Yes. Little tiny venue uh, that hosted some incredible legendary photographs. I mean, uh, legendary artists doing intimate performances, you know, where these artists could have been playing in front of five or 10,000 people. They would come down to McCabe's and was, was McCabe's in Santa Monica? Is that where that yeah. is? I've, yeah. been there, I've been there once. I actually shot Richard Thompson there for yeah. a cover of a magazine. I shot, I shot one of his weddings. Oh, awesome. <laughs> In the, in the living room with Los Lobos playing. <laughs> it wasn't a performance. I just, he suggested it as a location for the photo shoot. Oh, that's great. But here's Ricky Lee Jones. And of course we have Joni Mitchell here at McCabe's, you know, with a price tag on the guitar that she pulled off the wall to play. Which uh, also, which also uh, just a little sidebar here that, you know, all the early folk artists, I mean, practically all of them played Martin guitars. I mean, Martin guitars, was the guitar. I mean, now we have Collings, we have Taylor, we have, but everybody played Martins. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an important, I think, piece of information. And they, they actually have a museum uh, in uh, Pennsylvania and I have panels up there of, of my work. So, um, but- this, uh, this next shot with Joni, this is Eric Anderson again. And that's the guy yes. photo from the sixties on stage with Linda Ronstadt. And is Eric a Canadian artist? Nope. No, he's, he's here. There's a documentary out on him now, I think, too. Um, he's he's He performs. He's really popular in, in Europe and Scandinavia now. Uh, we have Jackson Brown at a young age here playing at Baby McCabe. Jackson. Baby Jackson. And, uh, Rodney Crowell and his then wife, Roseanne Cash. Right. Um, I just, you know, I was trying to, you know, also how some of these artists just kind of pop up throughout the decades and with the, the artists, that different artists that they play with. Uh, there's there's just a thread that I think is really interesting historically. Uh, Bonnie Raitt with Sippy Wallace mm -hmm. of that shot. Chambers Brothers Band, and uh, it's funny when you first showed me this photograph, I thought uh, I thought is this the Village People? Like you know, the guys. <laughs> in I was joking, but you said no. You know, one of the Chambers Brothers had a day job as a security officer, and so he right. probably went from work and just left his uniform on. Yeah. Uh, Warren Zevon, the late great Warren Zevon. Here's uh, T Bone Burnett with Jennifer Warnes. Who? What was her big hit song? Was it Betty Davis Eyes? No, that was no, um, that was Kim Carnes. Um, no, uh, Jennifer Warnes has had different era uh, hits. She had a song called "The Right Time of the Night," her her own. But then she had "Up Where We Belong" with Joe Cocker, and then and then we've got "I've I've Had the Time of My Life" with Bill Medley. And then she's also known for, I mean, her album, Famous Blue Raincoat of Leonard Cohen songs, who she had sung with is just one of, you know, one of the most amazing uh -huh. albums. It, so this shot, so T. Burnett, Jennifer, Jackson Brown, Warren Zevon, and, and Richard Thompson. Is this at McCabe's? Yes, it is. I mean, just in, incredible. Like, this right. is just incredible. Like, the, this group of people on the stage together. Uh, Doobie Brothers reunion with almost every single member of the Doobie Brothers got... <laughs> left and Tyran and Bobby Lakine on, on percussion and, and, and uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter and the original drummers and, uh, and Keith Knudsen over there on the left next to Tyran. And I believe this next one, Michael McDonald, I'm assuming is from the same show, correct? Right. 
Um, you know, I'm a huge, huge Doobie Brothers fan. Uh, Bonnie Raitt. Uh, here's Charles and Aaron Neville of the Neville Brothers. Back when Aaron was in this one-piece jumpsuit, you know, the New Orleans legends. Uh, and then this is... Um, uh, who? Um, Eric who Burton and... Uh, oh, Eric Burton, right, Eric Burton and the Animals. Yes, of course. Right. Thank you. And... Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Ronnie Blakely, right? Is this Ronnie yeah. Blakely? Right, and Ronnie was part of Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review. And prior to that, she had been, um, uh, she was a star in, in Robert Altman's film Nashville that she got an Oscar nomination for, and she was amazing in it. And I had known Ronnie actually a little bit before that, and she came up to my house. We did some interview pictures, and um, I photographed her at the Ash Grove. And uh, then I found these pictures that I didn't even remember I had from the Palomino. And, and of course, there's the, it's it's not anything superimposed. That was the monitor speaker sitting in front of her with the Palomino stenciled on it, which was. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dion Warwick, just yes. love, love her so much. Um, oh, Marianne yeah. Faithful, who, I mean, legend, of course. And when, I, when we were looking at this picture of the day, I said, uh, she looks like Glenn Close here. Yes. For some good reason. And uh, um, uh, Brian Setzer of the Stray Cats and David Bowie in the early 90s, I'm guessing. Or is this late 80s at this point still, maybe? Well, this is late 80s. Let me let me backtrack for just a minute, if I could, uh, oh. onto the uh, Brian Setzer uh, photograph, uh, the Stray Cats photograph. Because my band, by then I was in, in a band called the Mustangs, which is now Mustangs of the West. And um, probably the biggest show we ever did was we got to play the Roskilde Festival in Denmark, which is kind of like they're, you know, it's still, it's still ongoing. I mean, they've had, uh, they have every, every amazing artist there. The year that we were there was like Joe Cocker and all these people. I don't even know how we got on the bill, but we got on, somebody canceled and our booking agents snuck us in. So we, we uh, went on after Edie Brickell and just before the Stray Cats. And so that's what this picture is from. And um, and then interestingly enough, um, one of the uh, the Mustangs of the West just did a recording uh, of a Chris Cornell song for a Chris Cornell tribute. And our producer um, happens to be Brian Setzer's producer. And he has, um, he has a, a guitar that Brian set, was Brian's that he gave him as a present. So he brought it to the studio for me to play on the Chris Cornell song. So it was like, awesome. It, it, looks, exactly like it. it looks exactly like it, but it's, it, I, or, but it's a different color. Brian has so many guitars, you know sure. what I'm saying? Those, those big hollow body gretches, yeah. And uh, of course, this is one of those times where you were on a bill as a musician, but you still brought your camera out. Yes, I started getting, getting smart. <laughs> Bowie, Kiss Unmasked. Yes. Oh, these are also, this is a whole section unto itself in the in the book that's about a show called Top of the Pops. And Top of the Pops is a very, very uh, well-known show in the UK that started uh, back in the 60s where the Beatles, I think, were on the, on the first episode. But they tried it in the US in 1987 here for one season. Well, they... I don't think they meant it only do one season, but it was one season. And um, I got hired as the, the official photographer. So I got to shoot all the artists on stage and set up a you know very basic uh, backstage portrait studio. So this is just a handful of, of the artists that, that I actually have photographs of from that show, but it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, and Bowie was one of the most char charismatic Matt, it was part of the top of the pops things. That's where that's. Yes. Starts. Yeah. So a couple of them are, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so I got to photograph them rehearsing and, and on stage and, and, uh, you know, singing the same song over and over again, but a uh, man, he just, the, the, the energy in that room was. Did you get you know, to do a portrait of Bowie when he did that? Did you I was going to say, he is like probably the only artist that I didn't get to do a portrait of for, uh, you know. Well, let's look at some of these top of the pops photos. We got Bowie, we have Kiss <laughs> Unmasked. We have yep. Sting, a young Sting. Yes. Uh, Depeche Mode, love this portrait of these guys. I love that, you know, what these guys are wearing. It's just amazing. I oh, yeah. Depeche Mode on stage. Uh, In Excess uh, with Michael Hutchins. And here they are backstage again. Uh, Michael, close up shot on stage. What a charismatic, incredible singer, oh, performer. I got to photograph him once only. Oh, did you? At a big arena. Uh, oh. Natalie Cole, who's, you know, incredible. Um, 
the big man, Clarence Clemens with Joe Cocker, just a great little duo there. Did Top of the Pops tend to put like musicians together for special collaborations or was one person opening for the other or was? No, no, there would be like, uh, Everybody kind of either perform live or to a track too. It wasn't it wasn't a b bunch of lip syncing, um, but there would be like whoever was at the top of the charts for those those particular weeks they got and they um, but they'd have like four different artists per show. I mean I have you know a lot of uh, I have a lot of other uh, the '80s artists too. You know everybody from the Alarm. Uh, Tiffany, I think we're alone now. You know, I just I, anybody who was hitting hitting the top of the charts uh, at that time. So, okay, so here with Joe Cocker and, and Clarence Clemens. Here's Joe Cocker on stage. Right. This is uh, Gloria Estefan and the Miami Sound Machine uh, backstage. Same thing. Uh, Carlos Santana. Um, this is LL Cool J, I believe. Is what's yep. going here, uh, Roy Orbison and Katie Lang. Yeah. Um, incredible. Love that portrait backstage. Just amazing. <laughs> I wish that I'd gotten a photograph of Roy Orbison. Uh, mm -hmm. Back to Belinda Carlisle again. So now we're into some color stuff. And um, uh, Tony Basel. Tony Basil. Yeah, Basil. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about what's what's going on here with this photo. <laughs> well, to to <laughs> Tony. Yeah, Tony's, you know, uh, I mean, Tony has a lot of claims to fame. She is, an, a, you know, uh, a very well-known uh, choreographer. And, you know, the most recent thing she did was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with uh, Quentin Tar Tarantino, and she choreographed Leonardo DiCaprio in it. I mean, she is, she's amazing. And she's like in her mid to late seventies now. And she, she is an incredible dancer. Uh, she just did a series of live streams on, uh, on our dance <laughs> you could learn how to dance the, the 60s dances go-go dances and um but uh and uh, she had this hit in uh late 80s or mid 80s i guess mickey which you know oh, mickey you're so fine and uh uh it was a music video that you know i ended up i ended up shooting all her music videos uh stills for them uh, that was her biggest hit, but she had another one called Time After Time. I shot that. And um, so it was remarkable because this was just prior to MTV, just prior to it. And yeah. so any videos that were done at the time were really promotional videos. They weren't really meant to have a life of their own. But, um, you I know, mean, she, could have been, she could have been as big as a Madonna just another year or two later if it was, you know, if it was, really was the MTV era. Well, she did get on MTV. She did get on MTV. And right. and and those those uh, uh, photographs are just are so, you know, you say Tony Basil and, and, and people who are aware of her and oh, Mickey, you're so fine. And, uh, you know, you see the cheerleader thing. She she uh, choreographed it and she sang it. And, uh, you know, she just. Uh, She's she's a Spitfire that one. Uh, John Denver in a recording studio, another one that I wish that I'd love to have photographed. Another one of those uh, pleasures that we all love and won't admit that. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and that was uh, uh, he was working. I was shot that for the Mix magazine. He was working with producer Roger Nichols, who was just did some amazing stuff. And by then, you know, John had gone from looking like the dork, you know, with. <laughs> With his little round glasses, and he was actually a very handsome man, and he did so many, so many great things for the world philanthropically. I mean, he he was a good guy. Bad loss. And here's that out of Nina Simone that you showed us earlier on the cover of that CD. Yeah, it's a little different. It's it's an outtake from it, um, but you know that was a, uh, you know. <laughs> That story had such a, sh as a photographer, Jay, you would appreciate the story. I'll, I'll tell quickly, but she, uh, we waited for her probably at least three hours longer than it took to do the shoot when she finally showed up. Yeah. And when she, <laughs> when she showed up, she said, uh, uh, I want to wear a white sheet. So I went searching for a white sheet and she literally disrobed in front of my window. It was like, okay. <laughs> 
And uh, I had a wonderful other photographer who is much more adept at uh, studio lighting than I was named Deidre Davidson. And I always say to her, she goes, oh, that was the shot that you made. You did the greatest shot. And I said, Deidre, you made that shot. I would never have had that shot without your lighting. And um, but, you know, that was the shot that that apparently she liked well enough that she called me for the private session about five years later. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. And yes, I like to always say that um, our motto is we just hurry up and wait. Yes. <laughs> We're always waiting for artists. Uh, legendary uh, singer, folk artist, activist, Odetta. Uh, yes. Love this photograph. I got to photograph her on stage at Hardly Strictly Bluegrass around the same time period, just before she passed away. And uh, yeah, I, just, I had to sneak this picture in. I, I had some photographs of her at the Fillmore East, but the negatives were missing and they just didn't hold up. And I wanted to have her in the book. Um, I had photographed her also in the 2000s with her daughter backstage, some beautiful portraits of her. And when she was got very ill, um, just before she died, her her, I'd, I'd give, she, Odetta loved this picture. I, ha, I have to say that, not from an ego standpoint, but it's just was such an honor for me. I actually have a copy of this signed by her in, in my living room. Uh, and I don't usually ask for artist signatures, but that one, you know, she voluntarily did. And I gave her a print. And so when she was very ill and she was in this hospital in, in New York, and she gave me her business card. I have Odetta's business card of all things. You know, I love that. Um, but when she was very ill, her the doctors and, and, and nurses at the hospital had no idea who she was. And I guess she just, you know, was getting overlooked. So her daughter came into the hospital, her hospital room, brought this picture, put it up on the wall so that she could get some respect, you know, and, and let people know who, who she actually was. So, I, And then, of course, here we have the cover of your book uh, out now, Eye of the Music, and you can order it these websites that are up here on the screen. Sherry, that was so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all your work. Um, let's ask Harrison, Mr. Harrison, if you got any questions for Sherry. Yeah, um, our first question is from Anne, and Anne wants to know, out of all the artists that, you've, that you have photographed over the years, who have been some of your favorites? Oh my gosh. Um, well, of course, Joni Mitchell, Linda Ronstadt, um, you know, the one time I got to photograph Janis Joplin, um, some of those artists, David Bowie, I mean, just, uh, you know, as far as just having such impact and having such, uh, you know, a lot of these artists that I chose also to include in the book, I was really thrilled that they, uh, you know, if they you know, as I say, if their light hadn't gone out too early, you know, then a lot of them are still thriving and they're still performing, you know, so to, Judy Collins to, to, you know, I photographed her last year again and uh, over the years, you know, this book only goes through 89, but, you know, I have a whole, you know, I have a whole body of work from that point on as well. And uh, it's just great to see some of these great artists still out there doing it. Awesome. Great. Our, our next question is from Jeff, and Jeff wants to know who are some artists that you still want to photograph? Aha. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say who I wish I had photographed, like the Beatles or something. Um, but, Let's you hear know, that too. yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are artists I missed along the way that I wish I'd photographed, like like a group like the Beatles, I did photograph them all individually in, in, in their post Beatles years. But, um, Oh boy, I really have to think about the answer to that. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot. <laughs> did you get to photograph? Did you get to photograph John Lennon ever? Interestingly enough, yes, uh, uh, but not as a performance. He, uh, it was a Yoko Ono performance performance at Philharmonic Hall, and they were in. Uh, and there was a musician. Uh, I guess it was a musician strike or something going on. So um, it couldn't have been musicians, but there was some kind of strike going on, and. Uh, Yoko had to conduct this orchestra from her seat and John was with her. And uh, so I photographed the two of them there. And then, 
And then we all went, you know, this is just like, you know, I, I can't remember everything, you know, or how these things came about, but I know that we all went out to dinner afterwards. And again, it was a place with no light whatsoever. And I have, you know, I have, I have a couple of negatives I really need to work with where he's sitting there smoking a cigarette sitting next to Yoko. But that was it. Harrison? Our next question comes from Joel and Joel says, you mentioned that you first started playing music with an accordion. Do you still play? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have an accordion and I picked it up and I went, God, this thing is big and heavy. And um, <laughs> I didn't have enough reason to uh, uh, continue that. I, you know, I, I, I like playing different instruments. I, guitar is my main thing, but this year I got to, uh, uh, I, when we recorded, I got to play dobro and uh, we d actually did a Poco song uh, called Keep on Trying. And I played dobro on it and uh, Timothy Schmidt gave us a, his seal of approval. He was the writer on it. Our next question comes from Sue, and Sue asks, has performing on stage yourself had an impact on how you capture moments when you're behind the lens? I don't know about that specifically. I mean, I just feel like I've, I've you know, I'm not a solo artist. You know, I play with the band, um, but, you know, I've been around stages so much, on stage, backstage, right in front of the stage. Um, you know, the, 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 the photographic aspect of it always connected me to a show. Um, there was one show um, uh, very quickly, uh, that Doobie Brothers show was very, very interesting because, uh, or very memorable for me because there was a play, it was at the Hollywood Bowl and I was standing in one particular spot at one particular time during a song. And, you know, Doobie Brothers had doubled, double drummers. And so uh, there was a very, very prominent rhythm section happening. And somehow in, in that particular song, and I don't know which one it was, but the rhythm of the song and the drum beat was exactly the same rate as my heartbeat. And I think that was the time that I felt most connected to the music ever, you know, at a concert that I was shooting. Uh, playing, playing is different, playing is different, but you know, uh, because I play, you know, I can, because I play music, I can always anticipate something that's, you know, a, a moment that's going to happen, you know, and I always try and make the performer, uh, even if they're emoting or sweating, I try and make them look as good as possible. Always. Yeah. Yes. Our next question is about your initial interaction with Jerry Garcia. After that interaction, <laughs> did you encounter Jerry again at any point in your career? No, not at all. Uh, it's just funny to look back on that because I go, God, if I'd had a picture of that or, or the picture of us with our guitars together, you know, I mean, I was no match for him, but it was, it was, uh, you know, it was just a moment that etched to memory. It's, it's like when Dusty Springfield came to my house one time uh, because she wanted uh, an earlier, that same earlier band of mine to, to possibly record a song with her. And it's like, oh, I want to get out my camera and take a picture of her, but it just wasn't appropriate, you know. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that initial encounter? With uh, Jerry? Yes. Or, uh, well, there's really not much. We were both backstage, war you know, he was warming up before a show and we were tuning. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, interestingly enough, I do have a recording of my band opening for him uh, from the from the Fat Fry from K Fat up in Palo Alto, which was a was a great series. But um, that was in the '70s, and and uh, you know, it was it was fantastic to be opening opening for him. Let's do a couple more questions, and we'll wrap it up. Okay. Our next question comes from James, and James says, "You grew up in New York, and now reside in Los Angeles." What differences have you noticed in the attitude or culture between the photography scenes in both cities? Wow, interesting question. Um, I don't have a really good answer for that because I haven't shot in New York for so long. You know, so, um, you know, it really was very artist dependent. It, it depended who the artists were. Um, and again, the size of the venues because, uh, by the time I came out here, you know, uh, over the years, it's like, 
you know, the, the arena, arena rock, you know, blossomed. And, um, you know, there were things I, you know, I shot and I shot in the arenas, but I didn't, again, like Jay, Jay was asking me, it wasn't, wasn't my favorite because it became, you know, a mosh pit of photographers, you know? So I kind of went back to shooting smaller venues and, um, you know, more eclectic artists. You know, I started when I started playing in, a, in my own country rock band. Then I started shooting artists that we were. I I got around to to shooting artists that we were performing with because the first gig I did with my band, the Mustangs, was with Lucinda Williams, for example. Um, then I ended up, you know, after that, shooting a a, a, a photograph of her for um, Acoustic Guitar Magazine. So I got more into acoustic artists. So that was that was different than some of the the early um you know iconic artists that i was starting that were still on a smaller level in new york the other thing you have to remember is that um the arc of how photographers and rock and roll interacted has changed so drastically over the last 50 years now sherry hasn't been shooting for all of those 50 years nor have i um but you know even when i first started shooting in the late 70s you didn't need a photo pass to bring a camera to any concert, right? That was a thing that came about in the early 80s. So, so within a few years, you couldn't just bring a camera into a concert. But for most of the 1970s, you could be a fan and bring a camera to a concert. And that was the case in the 60s. Also, the way bands interacted with, with photographers back then is different than how they interacted in the 70s, was different than in the 80s, than in the 90s, than in the 2000s. And oh, so yeah. it's kind of ongoing, ever-evolving shift in how... Uh, photographers are treated. So when she was shooting in New York City, I'm sure it was a very small, small group of people, you know, people like David Garr and, and right. you know, a handful of photographers that were shooting, you know, let's say in 1969 or 1970, some of them professional, some of them on a higher level, some of them on a lower level. And uh, by the time she got to LA, it was still this very newish organic scene. And then as time went on and bigger arena shows and more credentials and more restrictions on where you could shoot from and how long you could shoot for one song, three songs, the soundboard, the pit, the edge of the stage, whatever it might be. It always is, is changing and, and, and evolving. So. Yes. Um, and just what Jay's saying is like, we, we had access. And even if I had to be uh, credentialed um, it wasn't like there were like, you know, dozens more photographers credentialed at the same time, you know, I mean, in the earliest photos, like walking up to, <laughs> To, to Joni Mitchell and standing in front of her and taking pictures, uh, you know, is it's like I impossible now. I mean, you know, I heard that, you know, and one thing was originally we were going to include the 90s in this book, but of course it got a little big, so that wasn't going to ha be happening. But I looked at my 90s pictures and it's like, uh, you know, that's when people like, uh, you know, Britney Spears came along and stuff like that, where you literally had 30 seconds to shoot her and then you were ushered out. So there was no room for the art. And that that's the, the cool thing about when Jay and I were, were, were starting out, you know, even even just a few years difference is that we were, I mean, you know, not not from an ego standpoint, but we had the opportunity to create art, artful photos. We, we weren't rushed out of there and like, you know, shoot, you know, 500, uh, 500 digital pictures on a, on a uh, in a burst. Uh, mode on our cameras, you know, I shoot digital now, but I'm also, I'm also um, less, I'm also more careful because I used to shoot, I had to get a number of shots on a roll of uh, 35 millimeter film that had 36 um, chances, basically. So it's, it's very different. And that's why I've gone back to the smaller venues and shooting for um, artists that I either know or really love, um, who are, are more accessible. All right. Um, I think that might be it for questions. Um, thanks everybody for watching and joining us here at fans.live and, and uh, the Relic channels and, and whatnot. Sherry, thank you so much for putting this together with me. Um, oh, such a joy looking at your body of work. Um, Sherry's new book, Eye of the Music, uh, out now. You can order it on these websites here, Genius Publishing, Genius, GeniusBookPublishing.com as well as uh, Sherry Barnett Photography. So check it out there and um, support your local photographer. Thank you so much, Sherry. We really appreciate your time. And everybody else, keep an eye out for new shows in 2021. We'll start announcing them right after the new year. And uh, hopefully you'll join us and tell your friends about our uh, 
little world here, digging deep into the world of people with cool stories and cool photographs. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so yeah. much, Jay. Good <laughs> holiday. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay COVID free. And let's get through this together and get back to the garden where we can rock and roll. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> okay.